Today on TechNATO, we'll be breaking down all the news from Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference and not just the $1,000 monitor stands. We're also going to talk with Chris Brenton from Active Countermeasures, and that's all coming up on TechNATO, starting right now. Hello and welcome to TechNATO. I'm your host, Peter Van Rysdam, and I'm joined, as always, by Don Pazette and Justin Dennison. Gentlemen, how are you doing? Doing great. Excited. Cool. Thrilling. <laughs> adventure packed I'll episode tell you what, of us. I believe this it. is the first thing people hear. They're going to go, ah, just hit next. <laughs> well, we're going to be joined soon by one Mr. Chris Brenton um, from South Florida. He is the COO of Active Countermeasures, and uh, we're actually going to talk about a pretty cool uh, product, uh, an AI uh, threat hunting uh, kind of thing <laughs> that can get check, all check the Check your buzzword bingo, bingo yeah. card. <laughs> yeah, AI yeah. yeah, right off the bat there for you, but I can't avoid it. If you want to play buzzword bingo along with us, head over to go.itpro.tv slash buzzword dash bingo. Download your buzzword bingo card and, uh, and go ahead and check off the free space and AI. Uh, if you have AI on your card, because it is different for everyone. But um, yeah, hopefully we'll we'll knock off a lot of these here today because we have a lot of great news about uh, a lot of buzz buzzworthy buzzwordy things. <laughs> that is All right. All right. Um, it, yeah, it was tough to say. Uh, the first of which over at CNBC.com. Google services restored after outage made YouTube, Gmail, and other apps unavailable. So this was something that, especially for companies that use like G Suite for their, uh, you know, all their email and, and Google Drive and all that stuff, that, that was a big problem. Yeah, you know, th they've actually updated this article since it came out and changed the headline a bit because originally it was extolling uh, the terror of Snapchat being down, which I just thought was hilarious because who gives a crap about Snapchat? But <laughs> well, what I want to know is, you know, if Snapchat's down, does that mean that I can't post my stuff or I can't just look at myself in the phone with dog ears on. No, I think you can still do it with dog ears. Because that's thing. not like calling out. To no, that's, not, that's mode. just, yeah, that's Thank just uh, within the app. It's funny that this article, since that update, users reported that Gmail, YouTube, and Snapchat. So that headline, that little bullet point, I was like, wait a minute, that, did Google headline. buy Snapchat? <laughs> uh, but... I don't think they have. Yeah, so uh, it's really interesting because uh, Google, much, much like Amazon, said, look, we've got all these servers to support our infrastructure. We should launch a cloud service. And so they launched the uh, Google Cloud. And uh, so they use it for their own services, but third parties can use the Google environment as well, like Snapchat, which uses a number of Google Cloud servers uh, from the GCE or Google Compute Google Compute Engine? Is yeah, that what it Google is, GCE? Compute Engine. So, uh, so they use it. Apple uses it. So um, it, when you back up something to your iCloud, part of iCloud is actually in Google's cloud. Uh, and, and it's actually on Microsoft's Azure as well, so they're multi-cloud. Uh, well, it was really interesting to see on Sunday when Google Cloud went down. And you know, anytime you have a major cloud provider go down, I always want to hear about it. Like, here's people who are pumping billions of dollars into their infrastructure, and they have an outage. How did that happen? Right? And, and it also makes me feel good about any outage that I've ever had because I'm like, well, hey, it happened to Google. I'm at least as good as them. But uh, in this case, they came out in the beginning and said, we've got an outage, and it's tied to increased traffic on the eastern seaboard in the U.S. And I thought that was a really weird thing to say. Like, if, if there's increased traffic, you're telling me somebody's generating more traffic than what Google Cloud can handle? They they have and YouTube. <laughs> yeah, YouTube. I really. Yeah. It, so so what does that even mean? Like, how, how could somebody pull off an attack like that? Well, they finally pushed a update, and uh, their vice president of uh, I forget his actual title, but the vice president of keeping crap up in Google Cloud. Uh, <laughs> that's his unofficial that's title. Uh, released a blog post explaining what happened. And uh, apparently they had a, uh, a patch or a configuration change that was being rolled out to a small amount of servers. And I guess somebody clicked the wrong button, and that update went out to practically all of the servers in that area and made it where they were unable to access over half the bandwidth that was available in those data centers. So just they immediately shut off half their bandwidth. So to them, it looked like there was elevated traffic when in actuality there wasn't. There was normal traffic, but their bandwidth 
drop down. Spread across a smaller load of computers. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we learn a little bit here. Uh, one, uh, that they're not very careful about bulk scripts, which we've seen before. Uh, but two, that they have over double the bandwidth they need, which is pretty impressive because they, they've got some massive amounts of bandwidth. Uh, but they did get it resolved. They got it fixed. But it is another reminder about multi-cloud deploy deployments and how important they are. Was it the Windows uh, October update that they rolled out? So oh, probably. Yeah. Probably yeah. Was. yeah. Their, yeah. their meltdown patch. Yeah. <laughs> For some reason in my mind, I just see like someone go, all right, it's time to update. And they went from like a fire hose and, you know, Billy, the new intern, went and screwed a garden hose on it. I was like, there we go. I, I changed all of them. Well, I love the uh, thinking about somebody that's that's doing work and they're on Gmail and they're like, oh, Gmail's down. What? I'll head over to YouTube and just kill some time. YouTube's down. Well, I got a Snapchat about God this. We, no! Yeah. You know, <laughs> one of their Snapchat. network engineers had made a post on, I believe it was on Reddit or Hacker News, uh, and they were saying, you know, this is a really bad outage for us because not only is it affecting these bigger systems, it's affecting the system we use to communicate when there's an outage. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like their internal team communication was messed up. Uh, so that, that, that's not good. But it did turn out to be very regional. Like if you were using the European servers, you were fine. But if you were using any of the Eastern Seaboard Google servers, which are, are the most common, those were all pretty hosed up for a, for a good period. It was at least six hours. It was a, a good long outage. Wow. Yeah, I thought Justin Bieber like dropped a new video and that had just caused... Uh, a, a, a Kardashian went to a library. Yeah. That's just how I know I'm out of the loop. I didn't even know those people were still around. I think they're still alive. Well, no, yeah. not alive. I Just like that they're relevant. Uh, you don't know Desposito? No. Okay. I don't know Desposito. But I do know that they're relevant because we make them relevant as a society. Yeah, I just did. <laughs> Let's stop it. <laughs> it's me the whole time. <laughs> All right, uh, our next article is over at ArsTechnica.com. What happened? How a remote tech writing gig proved to be an old school scam. A request to interview via Hangouts was odd. Then came questions about electronic deposits. So I, I love the ingenuity that they're putting in here and, and preying on people's hopes and dreams. Yeah, you know, it, you, preying on somebody who's out of work is probably one of the, the worst things that you can do. Uh, you know, here's somebody who is under, well, I, in this case, was the guy unemployed? I'm not sure that he was. Well, well I mean, but you're saying, what happened. you know, in other cases, you're going after the elderly for a lot of these scams, like the phone scam. So this is nice that they said, oh, well, you think that's bad. Yeah, well, let's reach out oh, a little God. bit. We're, yeah. we're going for orphans next. That, that's oh, our man. next Get target. Em. Get them. Uh, so what happened here is uh, uh, it's a whole big write-up on Ars Technica, and as always, they do a phenomenal job, but it is a, uh, a long read. But basically, there was a developer who was looking for work. He found a, a job opportunity that he applied to. They gave him a, a video interview. It was a hang. Oh, it was supposed to be a video interview with Hangouts. It turned out to be a text-only interview, which he thought was odd. Uh, but he he went through the interview process. Apparently, there was a you know a, a lengthy communication between him and the the company. And then they extended him an offer. So he got an offer letter, sign off on it. And then they asked about direct deposit information, which, you know. Most organizations do payroll via direct deposit these days, so that would kind of be on the up and up. But fortunately, the whole communication thread had set off enough red, red flags with the developer that he looked a little deeper into it, and it turned out to be part of a scam. And so this is a new type of scam where you apply for a job, you go through an interview, and it's all fake. And to me, I mean, it sounds like it is way too much work to try and scam somebody out of money. But if you can pull direct deposit information but not the deposit side. If you get the routing numbers to be able to try and write a check or do something of that nature, well, with a credit card, they can dispute, they can stop, you know, there's, there's chargebacks and all that. But when you take money out of somebody's bank account, they have to do an affidavit. A lot of times they can't get the money back unless the criminal is caught. Like there, there's a lot of things that happen there. So this is a far more damaging way to steal money from people. It's uh, an interesting take. This is one of those things where, I mean, you know, we talked about the elderly. He was, in fact, laid off. Uh, so I was like, okay, wait so a minute. He was I was work. trying to make sure because, you know, if you just get an email out of the blue, I would throw that out. But this seems like a lot of work to try to get that. Like, how did they know he had money? What if he has got, like, four bucks? Uh, like, my bank account. Well, then they hold on to that routing number <laughs> knowing he's looking for a job. <laughs> and he will get one soon. And I'll just check back in a few months and... And so do direct withdrawal. Do you think this is the only thing that, that these con individuals, like they're looking for these particular targets, or were there, what, do you think there's maybe more of a, a long game play here? 
like just trying to gather information about people to try to create a pattern or something? Because, again, well, it just seems like a lot of work. Shoot, a job application would be a great social engineering platform. You know, you can ask all kinds of great stuff. Yeah, age, social security number for tax information. Yeah. You yeah. know, that that's all stuff that, you know. Actually, you can just get them to fill out an I-9 which is uh, for uh, like employment purposes. And, and most people, they, they wouldn't fill out those documents until they were hired, right? That's how it's supposed to work. A job application is not supposed to ask for your age, not supposed to ask for your social security number. But I think most people wouldn't bat an eye at filling that out because they're applying for a job. That's a legitimate process. So really, really interesting side of things. Uh, I had wondered about that when online car loans first started because you're, mm-hmm. you know, when you take a car loan, you're, you're given all sorts of information to take a bank loan. Uh, so... They have to be secure. There's all these extra steps they go through. Uh, but here, making it a scam, that's, that just shows you you can't be too safe. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good read, and it, and it goes through, like you said, step by step. So uh, I suggest you take the time over at Ars Technica um, to do that and uh, see how you can make sure you avoid that. But it, basically, if something sounds too good to be true, it's probably someone taking your money. So there you go. Uh, all right. Over at helpnetsecurity.com is our next article. Nearly 12 million Quest Diagnostics patients affected by data breach. Uh, Quest Diagnostics, a U.S.-based company that offers medical testing services, has announced that a third-party billing collections company they use has been hit by a data breach affecting 11.9 million of Quest customers. So does this mean they have our data or they have our blood? Did they take our blood? So this one, this one's data, but they probably oh, have okay. data about your blood, oh, right? That's fair. Um, Quest Diagnostics, I think most people, well, I'm, US, I'm yeah. assuming most people in the U.S. would know them as the people who do drug tests for darn near every company. Uh, they have locations all over the U.S., uh, but they do far more than just drug tests. They they, they do health physicals and, and so on. So you go in, they draw some blood, and they run some tests. So they have some pretty sensitive information on you as a patient uh, and your, your health records and conditions, information that potentially could be used for blackmail, right? Uh, I know they do uh, STD testing and, and things of that nature, and that's the type of information that you could easily hold over somebody's head. Uh, the fact that they got breached is pretty bad, but it's it's interesting because on, on every headline, it's Quest Diagnostics got breached or, or something. But at least on HelpNet Security, they're a little more a little more specific, saying Quest Diagnostics patients affected by data breach. So Quest didn't get breached. They had a subcontractor uh, who also didn't get breached, and the subcontractor had a sub-subcontractor for medical billing, and they're the ones that got breached. And that's how you can look at a company like Quest that is massive, right? They are. I, I don't actually know what their annual revenues are, but I, I'm sure they're in excess of a billion dollars annually. Uh, so they're they're a massive company, but as you work down that supply chain to the smaller and smaller contractors that are providing services to them, you get to companies that are on a much tighter budget, have weaker security, and potentially can be leaking out your data. And that's exactly what happened here. So lots and lots of information being leaked out. Uh, When I heard it was medical billing, I thought to myself, all right, well, at least it's just like a credit card theft, name, address, maybe the amount that you owe. But apparently medical information is contained in the invoices. Uh, So it would have like what tests were run, not necessarily results, but what the tests were. So, uh, you know, they could make some assumptions. So if you're doing an STD test, then, you know, maybe you thought you had something so we can hold that over these people and see if they reply. Uh, So I looked up revenue. Now, this is just a quick Google search. So don't 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 take this as a bank. Uh, seven point seven billion dollars uh, yeah. in twenty seventeen. Now I that was two like years ago. That the bank. That's that's a, that's a lot of money. But I also want to warn: like I don't directly go to Quest, but I do know that any tests that are run for health purposes are actually sent to Quest for uh, actually diagnosis. Uh, they have a lot of machinery on hand and things. So if you don't directly go there, you could still be involved. Y- you could still yeah. be affected. And yeah. it did say in the article that they they're not entirely sure of the extent. Of the breach, this is an estimate. Is that right, or, or has that been updated? Yeah, and the main the main problem they're running into is this subcontractor. Uh, you know, obviously didn't have adequate security. They didn't have extensive logging systems and tracking, and so they're having a hard time, you know, digging through it. So it'll take forensics experts a while, uh, the digital forensics experts, to go through and identify everything that's affected, what information was accessed, and that that's pretty much true with any breach. It takes a little bit of time to to sort through it. Do we know yet if it if it was um, like accessed? through the subcontractor or one of the subcontractors employees was just, you know, someone that had access, had a password, just went in and 
and was nefariously acting. You know, I haven't seen details on that specifically, and I would assume I, that an employee leaking it out would be the easiest, yeah. but that's also the easiest to figure out. Uh, so that's where I, I'm under the assumption or from the details, the, the few details that I've seen that this was more of a, a breach. Uh, they don't really call it out. The actual subcontractor that we're talking about is AMCA, which, um, stands for something like oh, American Medical Collection Agency. So, you know, they probably do collections for a number of different organizations and industries, not just medical billing. Uh, although Quest is big enough, maybe, maybe that's it. So, um, uh, they basically are the sub subcontractor. Optum 360 was in between, and technically, employees at any level along that could have access to it. And uh, you know, if a if you spend a ton on security, but then your employees have access to more information and a way to exfiltrate it, then all the money you spent on security was just pissed away. That's true. Boom <laughs> boom. <laughs> and they tested it. <laughs> uh, so I, I used to work for as a subcontractor for government contracting, and this was something that we had to regularly go through because um, employees having access, regardless of physical security, uh, technological security, the fact that we had access or the capability to access information, we were the biggest vectors for like exfiltration of data. So we always had to go through training, updates, you know, I don't know, just a big old storm of paranoia. And you were drug tested every other month? Uh, well, Possibly, yeah. No, we know Just, you were. We have the data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's right class, here on the internet. Yeah, right. Why were you the only employee tested every other month? Uh, but, I don't uh, know. <laughs> they said it was randomly random. selected. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, now let's head over. Uh, we've got another article to talk about, but we also need to take some time to talk about the website that it's on. <laughs> this is the um, best website. So this is. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna read this URL as I see it here. Uh, Hits with a Z. Dot com. Dot my. <laughs> uh, so we're on the, uh, so what was Malaysia? M-Y? Uh, probably Malaysia, yeah. Just a guess. Justin's going to. I had to guess. Our, our researcher, Justin, back here. So over at IT Pro TV, we have a very well-respected security researcher on staff, Mr. Adam Gordon, who uh, authored the CISSP study guide and, and so on. Uh, He's you know, off at the National Cyber Summit right now. Yeah, I mean, just known in the industry. and. Adam will frequently share with me security articles that are important. So it's kind of, you know, he's one of my sources for that. Uh, and I, I, I super appreciate the work that he does there. Uh, I would not have clicked on this link had it come from any person other than Adam. I don't know where he found this website. This is like the worst site possible. Do you have an ad blocker on too? I do have an ad blocker because without it, it's a nightmare. Okay, but what is that? What, what do you got on the top there? That uh, some kind of music playlist? That's an okay, album so cover. Okay, so that's not an ad. album cover. Okay. So you have an ad, but right below that, but we I all have like now playing before it. So I don't. I turned my ad blocker off the other day. I, I was having some issues with it. So what what I see is a huge ad, then the the hits logo, then a, an album, and then another ad. I have to scroll to get to even the headline of this article. Okay, well, I'm going to turn off my ad blocker, but uh, I know there were some pop-ups, too, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, it wanted to know my location uh, right off the bat. Oh, there it is. But oh. yeah, so here's this article. Nice that's, a, that's a great Tableau looking one there. the five most influential visual. You know, Tableau's really getting their money's worth on this they site. They really are. They're, it's the whole site. <laughs> Half the page. Are you on the Tableau I site? feel like I need that white paper. See, you haven't gotten the article? Still haven't gotten the article? You've made it. Here it is. Okay, All right. so uh, this article, <laughs> if you're traveling to the U.S., you'll have to declare your social media account to get a visa. Um, so, again, we'll talk about this, but if you keep scrolling, Don, uh, we're, just, we're just going to, uh, to Gift Town. Uh, we have a one-way ticket there uh, because instead of using any images on this, uh, this site for the it's, news article, it's, it's just gifies. GIF after GIF, yeah, all, uh, uh, via uh. Giphy. Uh, oh, remember Sabrina the Teenage Witch? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great show. All right. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, it just goes on and on. And oh no, zero comments so far on this because no one's made it all the way down to the bottom of the article. Uh, uh. But so, so let's talk about the article now. Um, this I know this was something that I'd I'd heard rumblings about in the past where people had said, um, "Hey, turn off your phone before you go through customs; otherwise, they'll ask you to unlock it." And, and in some cases, when they're trying to validate where you came from or or if you're on a list or things like that. But is this saying that this is something that is required now? All right, so. Um 
there have been a couple of stories over the last years, like you said, where uh, people coming into the country, especially if you're on some kind of watch list or, or coming from certain countries, they ask for your social media identities, right? So they want to be able to look at your Twitter feed or your Facebook or, or whatever to see if you've been posting. Um, oh, you, you used know. hashtag ISIS. Yeah, right uh, yeah. there six months ago. There, you know, Oops. If you're in that Facebook group, they want to know. <laughs> uh, and I, I guess that makes sense to somebody. But, I mean, honestly, if you have five Twitter handles and they ask you what your Twitter handle is, you just give them one, then you've yeah. defeated the system. So it's kind of dumb. At I Love America. And, yeah. So uh, the way this headline is written is not really written for somebody in the U.S. So they're not saying that, like, American citizens are having to do this. Uh, and so this, I'm assuming, is in Malaysia or wherever. Uh, but... People from other countries passing into the U.S. are being asked for this information in some scenarios. It's not an every person type thing, but it's usually a small leap for that to become an every person type thing. The reality is, though, if you're going to be flying into the U.S., they already know you're coming because the, air, the airlines report all that information. And so they can look at your background and pull all that information ahead of time. Uh, this would really just be if you showed up uh, at the border in the middle of the day unannounced, right? Like if you're coming from Mexico into the U.S. or Canada into the U.S. So... You know, that you may be requested for this information. The turn off the cell phone thing, what's going on there is judges have ruled, and this is surprising to me, that uh, it's okay if you're arrested, the police can take your phone and hold it in front of your face to unlock it, or they can take your finger and hold it to the phone to, oh, to do the fingerprint unlock. See, I hadn't heard about that. And you didn't have to say anything, so your Fifth Amendment rights don't cover that. Uh, so that that's actually been ruled okay. But if you just have a passcode. If you turn the phone off, oh, when you yeah. turn it on, the TPM is locked, and you have to enter in your PIN number. Mm. Face ID doesn't work, touch ID doesn't work, the fingerprint scanners, you know, all that stuff doesn't work until you've entered in your PIN at least one time. And so that's why they tell you to turn your phone off. Is, is that under, like, constitutional review or anything, or is that, like, that's done? Well, I'm sure that that's going through the courts. <laughs> yeah, if, like, if that's the like case. I'm just like, ah. Um, that doesn't seem. Uh, I don't believe it is going through the courts, no. and if it is, it'll likely get dismissed. Because a lot of this stuff is done under a national security letter, an NSL, yeah. and they, like, rights don't exist once something is in an NSL. That's well, That's tricky what for me because I, I want to film my whole altercation with the police and Facebook Live it. But then I have to be able to real quick turn off the phone while I'm being cut. Yeah, why? Why you you run away? Right, you gotta. Oh, you that's gotta, why you run. Yeah, you gotta do it while you're right. running. Yeah, or you get two phones. I should point out that uh, the Technado is not uh, a legal advice service, and <laughs> good, <laughs> good point. Do not run. Um, yes, yeah. I mean, running's bad and, in general. Uh, <laughs> make you, make so. strong choices. Uh, and, but yes, dot my is Malaysia. Oh, thank you. By the way. Yeah, I, I'm not a big rights activist or whatever, oh, yeah. but uh, right. uh, I think <laughs> you're kidding yourself if you think that anything you do online is private. Uh, you know, unless you built your own internet, you there's just too many elements you don't control. So uh, that that idea of digital privacy is that ship has sailed. So the people that are fighting for that. They've already lost, uh, and you know that's just kind of where that is. I like that they want to know the social media, um, the accounts that you've used in the last five years. So you're like, D do I give you my Vine? Do you, do you, do you still want my MySpace? MySpace, yeah. You, do you know. want uh, use like, MySpace within want? the last five years? Well, it came back with Justin Timberlake when he he became an investor. I didn't use it, but I'm saying it. It, it, it sounds back. like you used. I it. I did not use <laughs> it. It sounds like it. I, I might have used it. No. <laughs> I will say I had trouble reading this article because I got really distracted by all the gifts. All the gifts. Yeah, I was like, how is yeah. these ads involved? I, I can know. save big on a trip to Tampa. It Adam's says. out of the office this week because I've been wanting to make fun of him. <laughs> so we'll, we'll have to hold off on it. Yeah. Well, I'm sure he watches Technado. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's head over now. We've got a lot of Apple news to talk about first uh, coming from TheVerge.com. Apple unveils macOS Catalina with iPad apps, new Apple Music apps, and more. And Don, uh, first thing you thought of uh, when you saw Codename, uh, or not Codename, but, but product name Mac OS Catalina? The Catalina Wine Mixer. Of you course. You know it. The biggest event of the year. It is. Exactly. <laughs> so I, I need like Rob Riggle behind us <laughs> going, biggest event. They're just I, a hype man. I mentioned that to uh, some of the other people here in the office, and they had no idea what I was talking what? about. Uh, and I said, haven't you seen Step Brothers? And they said, yeah. But I, I wait a like, minute. That, like the, then no, like, you have not seen Step Brothers yeah, if you don't uh, know. Apparently that. not the all. Catalina wine makes you fall asleep. <laughs> I don't know. So I was pushing because we were trying to guess what name the the next version was going to be, and I was really pushing for Mac OS Death Valley. Mm -hmm. You know, let's stick with the desert. Let's yeah. let's go, go but all in. 
apparently no Death Valley for us. So instead we get Catalina, which is some lame island somewhere. I don't even know where it is. Or, or Gobi? And they say it's Gobi off San Diego, Gobi. right? Catalina Island. Is it? I thought so. It's in that area. I don't know. Well, I just know it's a good salad We'll check dressing. with our researcher. The next one will be Ooh, Mac like OS Catalina. Seal Poop Island. How is or... Catalina dressing different than French? Uh, sugar. I've never even heard of Catalina dressing. Ah, oh, it's it's delicious. It was it yeah. I, that's what my my parents <laughs> used to have as as a kid. We had Catalina always in the fridge. But uh, good story. But they say with the new uh, <laughs> with Mac OS Catalina, there's so much more room for activities. Yes, absolutely. So anyhow, <laughs> stack the bunk beds. Up. Stack so, the bunk beds. You got it. You got it. Mac OS Catalina is coming out. It's got a lot of features. Uh, it was WWDC this week. I don't know if we mentioned that. Uh, the Worldwide Developer Conference. So this is where Mac- uh, Microsoft, one of those companies. <laughs> I, I just blew all my journalistic integrity. You make this fun is, of me. Yeah. <laughs> it's the, the event where Apple comes out and parades all the great new things that are going to break all your current software so that developers have time to fix it before it actually comes out. So most of what we learned about at WWDC this week won't actually be available available for several months, and that's a good thing because we need time for the developers to square everything away. Uh, but there's some really, really cool stuff packed inside of Mac OS. Uh, I've made fun of it for a minute. Let me talk nice about it now. Uh, one really cool feature is uh, Project Marzipan. That was the secret code name for it, uh, which is actually a pretty bad name, uh, has turned into a real product that's now a part of Mac OS that Mac OS will be able to run iPad apps. Now, this is not a just a big flip a switch and it's done thing, uh, which is the approach that Google took with their Chromebooks. Instead, what they're doing is they're saying developers can fire up Xcode. And right now in Xcode, when you write an app, you choose a target platform and your target can be iOS or tvOS or macOS. Well, now there's a special target for iPad on macOS. Uh, and so when you do that, you can recompile your app, and now it's supported. It's not going to be on by default, so don't expect a massive App Store update one day and all of a sudden there's millions of apps. It'll probably be hundreds or thousands of apps to begin with as developers start to change that over. Some developers, though, like Microsoft, with their Microsoft Office product, will be very, very fast because Apple also rolled out mouse support for the iPad. So you'll be able to attach a mouse uh, either via USB-C or via Bluetooth to your iPad, running iOS 13, and you'll be able to start to navigate that way. This is one of those things where they, they add mouse support to the iPad, iPad apps on Catalina. Is this eventually going to be to where we have a melding of these platforms, where I have a foldable, multi-screen, all-touch bar, iPad, Mac OS, Catalina thing? So, Apple, I know, cross your fingers. Uh, well, I'm, I'm just going to buy a touch bar. I don't need the rest of it. Just give me the touch bar. Uh, Apple is making every single move possible to indicate that macOS is going away and the iPad is, or the iOS is going to take over. However, they continually say macOS is not going anywhere. And I mean, repeat, even as recently as yesterday, uh, they had where Tim Cook did a quote saying, we're not getting rid of macOS. These are being developed in parallel. But they are making every move. I mean, they have they've gutted macOS Server. It's practically useless at this point, aside from Profile Manager. They might as well just rename it Profile Manager because everything else is gone. Uh, they have pulled most of the developers off of macOS and shifted them over to the iOS group. They uh, they just keep doing thing after thing after thing. Uh, in fact, one of the other articles that we'll, we'll talk about later is where they're they're yanking some of the some of the features that developers use inside of macOS. Really, really strange stuff going on for somebody who's dedicated to that platform, most of the announcements are related to removing features from that platform. So it's really odd. But uh, they have identified that Mac OS uh, is not suitable for uh, a mobile device, right? So that's why we have iOS. They've also identified that the iOS that's run on iPhones and iPads is the same right now, but it's starting to deviate, like mouse support. Mouse support doesn't make sense on an iPhone. And so they're actually splitting up iOS now, and they've announced that you're going to have iOS and iPad OS. So now Apple is going to have four operating systems, tvOS, iOS, iPad OS, and Mac OS. One company, four OSs. So I'm kind of interested to see like the iPad app on Mac OS. Like some of these iPad apps depend on like touch gestures and touch interactions. Is that something that ties into sidecar? where I can use my iPad as a secondary monitor or or am I going to get a touch screen 
MacBook. Oh, you're you're not getting a touchscreen MacBook. That I, I'm pretty sure <laughs> Steve Jobs put that in his like last uh, will and testament. Yeah, like uh, Tim Cook is allowed to be CEO unless he puts a touchscreen on laptops. In which case, uh, we sell everything to Bill Gates. You can have two mice though, and that can give you all uh, the gesture control. I get haptic feedback gloves, right? Yeah. I'm just yeah. You know, people don't know what they want until you tell them. Mm. Yeah, well, he's basically <laughs> he's put a touchscreen down here on the above the keyboard. That's not a touchscreen. I it's a touch, touch it. bar. Yeah, it's different. different. Okay. And if you speaking of differences, it's contextual. <laughs> speaking of differences, I looked it up, and uh, Catalina is somewhat darker than French dressing. Uh, French is typically light orange. Catalina was I naive for thinking he was going to talk about the island? <laughs> usually a reddish so the orange. Island is part well, of LA I'm County. almost done. Uh, it has a slightly sweeter taste than French, uh, and is tangy. Yeah, it That's is. What you it said is. with the sugar. I, yeah, with the sugar. Yeah. I, you can get it with bacon in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. man, that stuff will blow your wow. mind, change your life. But Catalina Island is part of LA County. Um, LA County. If it's the same one they're talking about, yeah, it's I'm a sure bunch it of is. Like, looks lovely. small little boats and. It looks real beautiful. Boats. Um, I don't know how. I'd... Yeah, <laughs> not going to finish that song. Nope, nope. I uh, sure not. We got to be careful there. Um, I'm not sure how it ties into Mac OS though. So, I don't think going. I know the boat song. Is that the uh, We're on a from boat? Step Brothers. No, from Step Brothers, boats. where they show mm-hmm. worldwide entertainment and they wreck his boat. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, Sorry, go back and it. watch yep. boats and. Yep. Uh, so there's more Mac so, stuff. Right? Uh, also on The oh, Verge, yeah. <laughs> the, we have the nine biggest highlights from Apple WWDC 2019. Uh, we just talked about all the, the OSs, but there's a, there's a cool video on here, uh, 13 minutes, uh, a, a recap that they do that quickly. So um, if you did not have a chance to um, skip all work that day and just watch the keynotes, uh, as many people do, uh, you can just uh, get all that that info right here and catch up. But was there anything else that we wanted to talk about specifically? We got yeah, there, there's some a couple stuff. Some uh, so security protocols. Some of the bigger things. I mean, the stuff I didn't really care about, like ooh, dark mode in iOS 13. <gasps> I finally didn't really care about dark mode in, in Mac OS either. Um, but uh, but they do go on to introduce a few things. Uh, you know, new AirPods that most people didn't worry about. The iPad getting its own OS though, that's a big deal. We're gonna start seeing separation there. Which seems like the opposite of what a company would want to do. It seems like they'd want to keep everything in one platform, but um, you know, what, what, what do I know? They make billions of dollars a year, and I don't. Uh, but somewhere in here, let's see, Swift UI Swift makes UI. coding faster. So they're releasing some updates to Swift. And Justin, have you had a chance to look at it? So I've looked at this a little bit, and all it reminds me of is if you've looked at Flutter from the Google team, it looks like Flutter and Swift. Uh, so it's like... You, you create all these little widgets, and you put the widgets on there, and you write them in Swift, and it's reusable. It uh, has very, uh, almost a React feel, like a web developer kind of feel. I haven't played around with it and like dug in. I just haven't updated Xcode to, to be able to interact with this. Yeah. But I did look through it. it. looks interesting. I just don't know how it'll work. Well, let's talk about the announcement that it has probably drawn it the most attention. Set and the that internet is- ablaze. What's, oh, yeah, it, yeah, it's it really everywhere. Yeah. Uh, Apple announced a new Mac Pro. A lot of people thought they were going to. It's been a long time since Apple has refreshed their Mac Pro. The old one, if you uh, remember, came out in 2013, looked like a trash can, right? The black mm. cylinder um, hasn't been updated since 2013 and has stayed the same price. Like, they never discounted it a single dollar in all that time, which is pretty impressive. Uh, but they did release a new one. And they have gone back to the more traditional tower, uh, and they had this amazing, I, I've got it pulled up here on my laptop, uh, a video kind of showing this desktop tower with a big handle on top that you twist, and the whole case comes off, and then you can get at the components inside because it is modular. That's right, an upgradable Mac. You can add hardware to it, take hardware out. It's almost like a regular computer. It's <laughs> amazing. So uh, so they've done that. Um there's it's two, cheap, right? Is it pretty cheap? There's two main things that are drawing in all the news right now, right? So, so one is the cost, and the other is the aesthetic, right? On the aesthetic side, uh, if you're an audio listener and you're trying to envision in your head what this looks like, uh, if you've ever seen a cheese grater, like the the larger hold side of a cheese grater, mm-hmm. it looks exactly like that, like literally exactly like that. I thought that's why they made it to where you could take the top of the case off, is that's how you got at the cheese in the inside. Yeah, yeah, because right. it all builds up in there. Yeah, I hope it's sharp yeah. cheddar in there. And the little fan cuts up any any other like big piece. I wonder if it juices also. 
Oh, yeah. We'll pour some, some in and find out, but I'm not going to <laughs> yeah. for that price. Yeah. Because of the price. Yeah. Um, I've actually seen conflicting data on this. Uh, the Verge article we're looking at here says that the base model starts at $5,999. I, uh, I had heard $5,000 originally, so I'm, I'm not sure that the store page is not live, so we can't verify that data. But even at $5,000, this would make the new Mac Pro one of the most expensive desktops available today that's not plated in gold, uh, which you actually can get. So um, so it, it's expensive. Uh, it does support massive amounts of everything. Uh, you can get up to 28 cores. It uses Xeon processors, uh, up to 1.5 terabytes of memory, although I seriously doubt they're going to be selling a 1.5 terabyte model anytime soon. A lot of times these are like the theoretical maximum for a motherboard, and they just advertise it for the heck of it. Uh, but there are 12 memory ports. You know, um, uh, I shouldn't call them memory ports. They have an actual name. Um, slot? I got a SIM slot stuck in my head, and that's the old stuff. But uh, uh, anyhow, memory slot, sure. So there's 12 of them in there, and you can upgrade and add more to it. It supports up to 1.5 terabytes. The base model, I believe, comes with 32 gigs, and that's about it. Uh, so that's a, an impressive uh, amount of, of hardware. No, 32 gigs is not impressive, but the fact that you can go even higher. In fact, in a lot of their benchmarks and stuff, they were testing with machines that had 384 gigs of memory, 500 gigs of memory, things like that. Um, it does have a plethora of other ports, USB-C, USB-A, uh, and so on. But the big talk has been all around the other modules, the MPX modules, where you can add in a number of video cards. They, uh, they're they kind of focusing on the Radeon Pro 580X and the Radeon Pro Vega 2s. Uh, and you can mind sticking in there. And I guess we don't really have a picture here that shows it, uh, but they come in these little blocks that you just pop right in. Uh, and so if you want to get some real Bitcoin mining going, you just pop in some more of those Thank cards. You. Check that uh, out. And you really get things done. Yeah, I got to get a buzzword in here. Um, you know, because mining cryptocurrency is not necessarily the best way that we can spend our time, but... Editing 8K video is. This is designed to be a video editing monster. And they said that you could actually be editing up to three 8K streams simultaneously with active effects without buffering and dropping frames. That's really impressive. That, that is. But if you want to see the things that you're working on on the computer, you'll need a monitor. Yeah, if only there was a monitor perfectly matched to this. Yeah, uh, there there is apparently the Pro Display XDR, and it is four thousand nine hundred and ninety nine dollars. Yeah, so what a discount! So I could use a regular monitor, right? Or oh, does it have cool. some some ter- yeah, type of like lightning compatible only HDMI interface? Well, you know, it's designed for video editing, right? The XDR side of this, so it is a theoretically color correct monitor is it touchscreen oh i seriously doubt it because <laughs> that, that would have made it cost three dollars more yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh so yeah it, it, you know for a video ed- if you're a, a hollywood studio color corrector that's exciting to you for everybody else it's basically a waste of money but it looks nice except it it and would it just matches. lay on your your desk just flat yeah you know it really needs a stand well if you act now <laughs> Uh, you can purchase a stand sold separately for nine hundred and ninety nine dollars. For the it can stand. also be used for home defense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, put it in a long tube sock and you just swing it around your head. So, so are they assuming otherwise you're putting it like on the wall? Like, why is this sold separately? Uh, I think it is because many people do have uh, like Vesa mount arms and stuff like that on their desk, uh, and so if you've got that, you might not need it. Do but, we even know that it's got VESA <laughs> compatibility on the back? Because you know, now with the words above my if, mouth, I don't know that it does. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna guess it. Hold on, it says uh, the modular design allows for the display to detach from the Pro Stand for portability, and also offers the option to attach a VESA mount adapter. Oh, that's uh, another six hundred bucks. Yeah, the answer is no. Is not VESA compatible? If you have to buy a VESA adapter, what the hell is that? So that means they're just selling you this monitor, <laughs> going, <laughs> yeah, enjoy that, just on I'm, your floor. I bet there's like a weird like. Dodecahedron screw or something that you have yeah. to like take out to pat- attach the vase. Uh, it probably comes with a pack of command strips. Ah, right? <laughs> it sticking leaves on nothing the wall. on the wall. Yeah, yeah. I mean, nice. what's the worst could happen if this crashes to the ground? Yeah. Five thousand dollars could be gone. <laughs> well, I mean, if you pay thirty k for your Mac Pro, who cares about that five thousand dollar monitor? 
So, my goodness. so my favorite tweet that I saw about this though was uh, people posing with their own thousand dollar monitor stands, which were just their college textbooks with <laughs> TV on top. Like, look, here's another thousand dollar. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. exciting. Um, there's a lot going on there. I want to. Yeah, it's a counterbalanced now, arm. They do have a quote that says, The Pro Stand will be available to order in the fall along with the Mac Pro, which can power up to six of them for a total of 120 million pixels. Here's the company's product page. Now, does that mean if you get one Pro Stand, it, it can power six of them? So is is this somehow... No, they're saying that the computer can... Power six power monitors? Six oh, monitors. I got it backwards. That makes yeah. more sense. So you Actually, need that six. sentence is written kind of odd. You need yeah. six stands, though. <laughs> Yeah, I need. All right, so let, let's 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 think about this monetary. Let's go with the thirty k, right, for the top end Mac Pro. Okay, I'm sorry, and it's I, thirty thousand dollars. Is that what you said? The, for the top end, yeah, and that's not a, a terabyte and a half of memory. That puts it like closer to sixty grand. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's thirty grand. Right. Okay, yeah, it's so a there's, modest. There's some system. conflicting because we don't know. Again, the store isn't because that's the first thing I do when new <laughs> Apple announced. I just go max and, it out. Max it out and go. Wow, that's a lot of money I don't have. So if I need six stands, that's six k. I need six of these pro displays. That's what? Uh, that's twenty four thousand dollars. Yeah. Right. So that puts me at thirty grand. That's sixty thousand dollars for one hundred and twenty million pixels. Beautiful. How, mu stands. how much is that per pixel? Now then? wait a minute. That doesn't include if I want to have the option of putting them on a vase mount arm. Well, but then you wouldn't need the stand. Well, but I want the, the option adapter. of putting it on the stand yeah. or mounting it to an arm. See, I, I imagine if you had six of them, you wouldn't want six in a row, right? So you, you you'd probably want to stack them. You'd need you a vase. Oh yeah, wrapped around. Yeah, I want to. I want to look over here and then look back here. <laughs> and you, then you'd need probably a new home. Yeah. So yeah. that's I don't know. Possibly a power 000. upgrade, ser like power service upgrades. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a significant investment is what we're saying. Yeah, although for free, you can actually take all the boxes that they come in and stack them into an igloo structure, which can serve as that home. Yep. Yeah. And so. you could put the mount or the monitors on top of them. Now, Don, I, I do have a... I looked around on the product page, and part of this 8K video thing is the Apple Afterburner, uh, which is an integrated like FPGA. Uh, have you heard much about this for like actually transcoding this this information or... So this is just brand new, and we don't know much. It, it's brand new. We don't know a lot, but the idea is that people work with different codecs, and different codecs encode different ways. And so by giving you an FPGA, in theory, it's a multi-purpose encoder that you can, uh, uh, I'm assuming, either flash some kind of custom firmware to it or at least have access to the embedded firmware to change options to be able to tweak it to optimize it for what you're trying to do, which is, is really a, a, a neat idea. Uh, I've curious to see how that works in in you know actual real life but it sounds neat <laughs> i'll give it that uh, it's, but we've been talking about all these things that have been added uh, but they're getting ready to take away some things right don yeah and and uh, after i read this i i kind of I, I went to justin to talk about it ahead of time uh, if you've watched any of my mac shows uh you'll know that i i drop to the command line a lot because i have a Linux and Unix background, and so I'm kind of more comfortable working in that than the UI a lot of times. Uh, so I, I work in the command line a lot. I use a lot of various utilities that are Unix utilities that are usually a part of Mac OS, uh, and I, I use homebrew tools inside of Mac OS to be able to install other things, get them up and running. Well, Apple has announced that with Catalina, they are going to be deprecating all of the Unix scripting languages with the exception of shell scripting. So... Uh, the built-in, the native Python uh, libraries and, and binaries. Uh, there is the Ruby, uh, who else? It was Pearl. Uh, Pearl, yep. So those are going away. Now, that's kind of a big deal. My first thought was, oh, I use Homebrew, and the way you install Brew is by calling a Ruby gem. Uh, and they, they give you that one-liner on the website, copy and paste this and just run it, and it's running Ruby to do that. Well, that's going to be gone the, uh, the author of Homebrew actually posted a tweet yesterday saying, hey, don't worry about us. We just have to rewrite a different installer. It'll be fine. Uh, it, so it might not be a one-liner cut and paste anymore. Now it's a binary you have to download and run. Uh, and that's what Apple's saying is like, look, if you need these for an app, you just need to package a static version with your app. I don't agree with that, but that's kind of what's happening. So, Justin, what, what's your thought? So that's great in theory, but as someone who's tried to, pa uh, to like package a statically linked binary from a Python app, uh, number one, that's a giant pain. Number two, well, 
is it now my responsibility to hang, handle updates? Now, that was one of the biggest issues with these built-in ones. I, I use Homebrew to install like new Python, right? So it's Python 2.7. I needed the version of 3. 2.7 is end of life, January 1st, 2020. I had some conflicts there. So on that side, it's great. But if I'm shipping runtimes for these interpreted languages with every application that I build, number one, they're giant. Number two, I have many versions, possibly ones that I don't have control over. I can't confirm whether like security updates have been done. Um, I don't really like that thought process. Now, if it was something maybe like Go or C++ where, oh, I've linked all these. These are just you know specific to Mac. There's no runtime per se that I'm not shipping. Then, okay, I'm good. And when I originally read this article, I was like, oh, Unix script. So what? But it's excluding shell scripting, which interestingly enough is no longer going to be Bash. It is going to be Z shell. Yeah, yeah, that was that was another one which we we did talk about before the show. It was kind of funny that they were switching from Bash to ZSH. And I now when I got started in the Unix environment, I started on Sun OS, uh, Sun Microsystems, what became Solaris, uh, now owned by Oracle or Dead or who knows. But uh, back then, ZSH was the default shell, at least on the systems that I worked on. So I kind of got started on it, but switched to Bash when I realized everything else used Bash. And Mac OS has been using Bash for a long, long time. They've decided to make the switch to ZSH. And I, Justin, I, even to this moment, I cannot come up with a reason like why default to ZSH. So it's odd. I have ZSH installed because I use a theming package called Oh My Z Shell for some configuration, but I use nothing else for ZSH. Uh, so actually, whenever I do some reconfiguration on the Mac, I'm going to get rid of it. But I thought the same thing. I was like, do I use any Z Shell things that, I, that aren't available in Bash? I looked them up, just a quick cursory glance. Uh, it looks like, you know, Don and I, you were, t you and I were talking before the show. It looks like Bash has kind of accumulated some of these features that weren't there. But a comparison, file globbing. Okay, actually, I've never had an issue where, like, my globbing pattern can't be, you know, expanded enough. Like, I'm trying to grep for something recursively. Spelling correction, directory aliases. <laughs> you know, I, I, I really... Like, I, like, there's nothing here that I go, oh, yeah, I do use that. So I, I knew we were going to dive into a developer topic that uh, that, that Peter would uh, yeah, you know, just kind of let us run with it. I I did not think you'd be able to get through globbing patterns without him uh, <laughs> contributing. No, I, I literally looked up and was just like, he's just making up words now. <laughs> uh, now, the only thing I can think of is I see, you know, I watch developer talks. I've noticed a great number of developers who are using Macs will install Z Shell, use Oh My Z Shell as their theming package mm -hmm. and their little aliases, like it has a bunch of Git aliases, but that's not necessary. So I don't use any of the updates for Z shell. Supposedly you can type Z and type a folder name and it'll take you to the last folder that was named that. I tried it this morning on my Mac that has Z shell installed. It does not work. <laughs> so I don't know how I'm just, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what the, the impetus is. So this is a change they've announced, but haven't really given a reason for. Uh, deprecating Python, I understand what's going on there, right? The, the native version of Python is Python 2.7. That has been, is, is it already end of life? Or is it coming? So it's end of life, January 1st, 2020. Okay. Uh, so they're coming saying soon. you need to move things now. And so Apple said, hey, instead of updating, we'll just delete it, right? So I, I get that. It's a path of least resistance, I guess. But changing the default shell, I... I'm curious if they'll ever announce, like, here's why we made that decision. Uh, it's just change for the sake of change, I and, guess. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Ruby was an old version as well that they recommended against. Um, and, uh, I mean, who uses Perl? You know, th they needed a lot of that stuff for the macOS server app because it had uh, Apache and all these other things built into the server app. But since they gutted that app, like I mentioned earlier, they don't need the tools themselves. And so now they're kind of knocking them out. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see where that ends up. Uh I imagine most people won't be too terribly affected by it at the end of the day. All right. Well, yeah, totally. I think we've. Uh, <laughs> I think we hit enough uh, Apple. Stuff we got all the day. all it's the Apple stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Our last article of the day is over on Slash Dot. Uh, blockchain firm planning to build smart city by Slock Dot It. Slock it. Um, so, by the way, uh, well, we already done. I already said blockchain, so check that off. Did anybody have glob 
modules or whatever you said. <laughs> globbing patterns. Yeah, globbing like patterns. the important one to yeah. fixate on. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> mine were mine were used to be swollen, but I, I yeah, a little penicillin takes care of that. Yeah, yeah. I'm allergic um, to penicillin, but not really. really. No, yeah. I'm not. Yeah. I'm allergic to uh, sulfur-based drugs. Huh. Like that's you a, care. That's and, a great. Uh, but you know what? Everybody already segue. knew because um, my quest data. Oh yeah, that's true. Out. Yeah, I already had that out there. Um, all right. So what 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 the heck does this mean? An Ethereum city? We're yeah. So um, we've made fun of blockchain a good bit, and As we've we made should. fun of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, all of which I've said in this podcast already. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there was this big land rush on blockchain where everybody was trying to figure out some way to use it and make it work everywhere, and it was a huge buzzword. So uh, this one company, Blockchains LLC, had come out and said we were going to create a smart city, a whole city that's powered by blockchain, where everything from the the stoplights to mail to everything is is managed by a blockchain. Uh, it's it's really smart. We've got to have it. Mm-hmm. Now, I laughed when I first heard that and just kind of thought it was silly, and that's that. Um, the company's still around, which is significant. Uh, and then they have acquired another company, Slocket. And that's, that's really bizarre because what Slocket did is they were trying to build an Ethereum-based computer. So now it's a, a computer, hardware and software, that are based – on blockchain to be able to operate. Now, if you're trying to build a blockchain city, you're going to need computers. It'd be nice if your computers were built on the same idea. Now, Ethereum is a cryptocurrency, so I'm not exactly sure how the computer is powered by cryptocurrency. That's what I was, yeah, that's what you, uh, I was trying to figure out what the heck that means. Yeah. And there's, there's two types of Ethereum because there was like a fault in the, the original, like, oh. uh, like a validator. So there's like a Ethereum Classic and Ethereum New or whatever because there was a, a split in Kinda the community. Kind of like Bitcoin Cash. Yeah, yeah. so... Because Bitcoin Cash happened after that, I feel like this is like a like oddly specific. Like these are just people infatuated, right? Or is there like v- validity to this? Um, you know what I think is powering this? They're getting funded. I, I think that as long as they find investors willing to put money in this, they don't actually have to create a product. And I really maybe I'm having lack of vision here, right? Maybe. 30 years from now, all the successful cities will be blockchain cities, and I'll be homeless, and they'll have every right to say, I told you so, Don, you're an idiot. But they won't say that because they'll be super famous, and I won't be. You will have the igloo you made out of the boxes from your $1,000 monitor stands. There we go. See, you know, you you choose your battles. Uh, But, yeah, it just shows the, the blockchain mania has not ended, and it is alive and well, even right here in the U.S. Well, well, Don, if it makes you feel any better, I think I'm along with you. I'm I'm just... I have a hard time understanding how this is applied uniformly over like a large ecosystem, like a city. A, a few things, okay, but computers, hardware, software, locks, people interactions. I can understand contracts, right? Yeah. But I just I don't understand how it can just be applied as a w- giant band aid to everything. I think this is is more of like an Ayn Rand thing. If you've ever read any Ayn Rand books, where she would uh, she would always propose these grand ideas. Uh, but then when you got into the brass tacks of how do you make it work, that was always left up to other people, right? You know, we'll work out the details later. Don't worry about that. But that's kind of how this is. Like, we're, we're going to have this idea, and then we'll have all these different agencies that take care of the different pieces of the puzzle to make it all work together. Did you just make a connection between cryptocurrency and objectivism? Uh, yes. And that is amazing. You heard it here. Anne Rand's probably rolling in her grave, isn't yeah, she? she yeah, is. Well, she is. you know. Uh, what, unfortunately, I had to read a couple of those books. And uh, yeah, I didn't understand that any better than this cryptocurrency city. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, uh, yeah. We'll all be living there. It's going to be very exciting, and Don will not be allowed <laughs> in our cryptocurrency city. Yeah. I like my computers powered by the invisible hand of capitalism. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you who will join us uh, in our crypto city is uh, likely Chris Brenton. Um, he is the COO of Active Countermeasures. And, uh, Don, he's somebody um, you've interacted with a little bit oh, yeah. through yeah. Uh, Security Now or Wild West uh, Hack and Fast or a few different no, things, no, through right? uh, uh, Paul Security Paul Weekly. Paul Security Weekly, yep. thank you. So uh, Paul Asadorian over at uh, Paul Security Weekly, he's a, a former SANS instructor, uh, Chris Brenton, also former SANS instructor, and John Strand, former SANS instructor. Uh, John Strand is the CEO of Black Hills Information Security, right? They do pen testing and all sorts of crazy hacking stuff and are all around great people, like everybody at that company is super nice. Uh, they had created a, a product called Rita that's an open source product, and they, they created it from all the work they were doing inside of the pen testing space. They have 
commercialize that into a new company, into active countermeasures. I shouldn't say new. They've been around for years. Uh, and so that's what Chris is going to be talking to us about in this interview. I'm disappointed. I don't have pen testing on my card. And Oh, shoot, I just gave it to Don by saying <laughs> Thank it. Thank you very but much. But you don't have it either, I don't right? have it either, but They're... I wasn't about to say it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's uh, screwed up, but he uh, still doesn't have bingo. Well, you know what? I'm hacking away from getting bingo, and there is no way he is going to go the entire interview without saying hacking. Yeah. Well, we'll find out uh, in, in a moment here, because uh, we're, we're going to go ahead and shift gears and uh, listen to that interview with Chris uh, right after this here on TechNado. My name is Dana Morrison. I'm the IT director at Grace Christian School in Raleigh, North Carolina. IT directors often hoard so much knowledge that it's hard for their team members to learn. IT Pro TV has given us the ability to level up our technicians to a point where they can decide this is important for me to learn. I would recommend IT Pro TV uh, to any IT team. It's just a great tool uh, for any IT professional. Hello and welcome back to TechNado. And as promised, we have an interview now, and we've we've been doing a lot in the D.C. and Baltimore area, but we're we're heading down to our neck of the woods now in Florida, down in Cape Coral. We've got uh, Chris Brenton, who is the COO of Active Countermeasures. Chris, how are you doing today? Good. How are you, man? We're we're doing pretty good, and we're we're just uh, having some fun talking about all the cool stuff you've got in your office. It's kind of like <laughs> the background of our our room here with all the the fun games and toys and stuff. And definitely want to talk about that stuff. But uh, but first of all, let's talk uh, about. Yes, I have a life. Honest, it's not. <laughs> it's well, you haven't finished the I Rubik's cube about. yet, so yeah, exactly. Clearly, you, you've got a lot going on. <laughs> uh, so uh, so Chris, tell us about Active Countermeasures uh, to start off. What what is the company and and the product? I think AI Hunter. So give us a little bit of background there if you could. AI Hunter is the commercial product. Uh, we open have, well, we have a main open source product called Rita, uh, but we've got a bunch of other open source tools that we've been releasing as well. Uh, our focus is network-based threat hunt. So the concept is identify if there's any of your internal systems that have been compromised. If there's a command and control server that's communicating between an internal system and something on the internet, uh, that's usually what we uh, refer to technically as a bad sign. Uh, something's gone wrong. But uh, yeah, that's our focus, because when you look at what's going on in the market today, uh, <laughs> this was actually kind of an epiphany for me, actually, because I've been, I've been in security for, God, 20, 25 years. I uh, was a SANS instructor for like 15. I did the log analysis class, the perimeter class, you name it. And I had an epiphany that we're doing this wrong. And what I mean by doing it wrong is when you look at the security tools we have today, everything kind of falls into one or two buckets. It either goes into that protection bucket. So it's like intrusion detection, or it's a firewall, or it's you know strong passwords, two-factor authentication, whatever the case may be, uh, or it's incident response. It's what we do once we know we're compromised. So it might be forensics. It might actually be incident handling. It might be you know uh, PR. You know It might be insurance. Where we're missing is that tie between the two that, hey, how do we tell when our protection has failed and when we actually need to go in an incident response mode? And as an industry, we're, uh, we're doing horrible because the industry average is over six months. So that's the problem we're actually in there trying to solve is how do we drop that six-month period of time down to something useful like 24 hours or less? That makes a lot of sense. So uh, I, I want to thank you, first of all, for uh, saying multi-factor authentication. Uh, <laughs> that was a check off on my buzzer bingo, and I think both of you guys had that on your cards as well. <laughs> sure did. <laughs> so thanks for that. Um, but I'm just curious, so how exactly does this work? Uh, how, what's your guys' approach to it? Is this, is this a piece of, of hardware that, that sits on my network? Is this something that's, that's done over the web? Uh, how, how's that look? So there's two possibilities. Uh, our preference is to use Zeek. So uh, there's a Zeek probe that watches all traffic going in and out of the, your internet link. So typically span port on the internal interface of the firewall, something along those lines there. That feeds data back to us. And then what we do is we process it in 24 hour chunks. So we're not just looking for like an instantaneous match on something that looks interesting. We're actually going through and saying, okay, here's the you know, previous 24 hours worth of information. Now let me strip out and look at all of my IP pairs. Do any of them look like beacon activity? Do any of them look like long connections? Do any of them look like, you know, meta interpreter where it might be a combination of those two? Do we have any type of persistent connections taking place? 
Once we identify the persistent connections, then we'll go in and we'll look at things like, you know, is the user agent unique within the environment? Is this on a known blacklist? You know, and that type of thing. But it's that persistent connection. That's the thing we go looking for first. And one of the nice things about looking at a 24 hour chunk of data is you can have an attacker that's rolling slow. So they're beaconing once per hour and that's it. And they've got, you know, jitter involved with it. And we're still going to be able to tag it because we've got a large enough data set to work with. Now, a minute ago, you mentioned some of the other things that uh, Active Countermeasures does. You mentioned Rita. And yes. I know Rita is a, a free, uh, is it open source? I know it's free. Uh, it's open source, yes. Okay. Gra and grab it, dig into the code, play with it. I will say uh, there's 24 patents on that code. So you can't grab it and use it in your own commercial tool. But as uh, as far as the security community goes, anybody can use it to lock down their network. And we actually use that for part of the processing within AA Hunter. Well, and, and, and that's where I was kind of going with this, is some of the things you described sounded like stuff that, that Rita did already. So uh, yes. what what does AI Threat Hunter do, do that goes beyond it? Is this like a, is it a fully managed uh, installation once it's installed? Or how does that work? Rita is great for, uh, it's great for the innovator. It's great for that person that says, oh, my God, I love packets. <laughs> you know, I, I wake up dreaming about my IP offsets um, and they want to get in. They want to play around. It's a command line based tool. And if you've got like a 100 megabit link to the Internet or less, read is an awesome solution to go through and use. If you need something for a security operation center and, oh, my God, I'm sure that's on somebody's bingo card uh, <laughs> in his sock. But if you've got a security operations center, uh, things get a little different at that point. Uh, you know, I've, I've run a bunch of socks in my past, and the typical breakout tends to be you've got one guru, right? You've got one person who's really smart who knows their stuff. And then you've got a couple of people that are in the middle, and then, you know, interns are a dime a dozen, so you've got a ton of those. And you need to be able to have an intern figure out how to effectively, you know, do something complex like a threat hunt. Uh, that's where AI Hunter comes in. Because the tool actually hunts the network for you. It tells you when you have something that you need to go in and address. Uh, we've actually geared it towards junior analysts. Actually, specifically, one of our early adopters, um, it's a medium-sized city out in the Midwest. They have two security people for the entire city, but they have a help desk of 25 folks. So their challenge to us was, hey, we could leverage the help desk, help us get the tool to work for them. So a lot of the features that we built in and a lot of the automation we built in was actually the task the help desk was doing for them. Uh, so we started with a run book and kind of worked it back from there. So AA Hunter, what that's really good for is my time is valuable. I need to make sure that, you know, we're not spending any more time on this than we have to. All right. So let, let's go back. I, I mean, we were talking about the solution. Let's go back to the problem. And you mentioned how uh, if more companies were paying attention to the traffic that was on their network, then we could reduce that window of, of time from a, for a compromise. And uh, actually, you know, you're down in South Florida, down in your neck of the woods, Citrix, right? Uh, it was very yep. well publicized that attackers had gained access to their local area network and had been in there for, as far as they could tell, at least six months before. Long, en long enough to grab a terabyte of data. Yeah. Ooh. A good long time, and and as far as I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you've got more details on this, Citrix never did detect them. That it was the the U.S. government that contacted them and said, "Hey, by the way, you guys, you've got attackers in your network." So <laughs> we found this out on the internet. We don't think you wanted it there. Someone <laughs> may have stolen it. Yeah, exactly. So uh, for yeah, and them. It, I mean, it, they're they're a technology company. You you would think they would have the processes in place. So where where do you think something like that broke down? What is it that companies are failing to do? Well, so I, I, I want to be careful here because I don't think it's a failing of the company. Um, and I don't think it's a failing of the security personnel. I think part of the problem is we just haven't had the right tools to solve this problem. And I'll kind of circle back on that one in just a second. But one thing I did want to point out about that was, you know, we talk about as an industry standard, I think, uh, you know, it depends on whether you're looking at like the Verizon study or somebody else's. But from when you get whacked to when it's detected, the average seems to be about 192 days. But as you're saying, uh, I think it's 53% of the time when we find out we've been whacked, it's by an outside entity. It's by someone saying, hey, this internal IP in your network is attacking me, and now you figure out, oh, no, the box is owned. Or in Citrix's case, the FBI comes to you and says, hey, so we found this terabyte of data that you probably don't want on the Internet. I think you actually have a problem. Um, Starwood is probably even a bigger example because they were in that network for four and a half years before it was. Um, 
Part of the problem is uh, attackers are using beaconing for the command and control and detecting beacons in our heart because it can look like a legitimate traffic pattern. You know, it can be TCP 443, you know, and it's, uh, you know, TLS handshake and everything looks normal. Um, and it's looks like any other website. It's not until you analyze that over a long period of time that you're able to say, well, wait a minute, it's checking in every 20 minutes, exactly every 20 minutes. There's something interesting about that. It's automated. That's not a person going in and doing um, and you need big data sets for that. And it's been a challenge to be able to find tools that do that. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, Rita was the first tool that you could actually take a day or more and say, process it all at once and show me if there's a persistent connection taking place between you know, any of my internal systems and any, anybody out on the internet. So, it's, so to those folks, I think they're trying their best you know, with the tools that are available to them we're just now starting to see tools that gives us a bigger picture of what's going on and allows us to be able to go through and decipher that type of traffic. I know one of the challenges I've run into in the past was I've worked with tools that worked on behavioral analysis. So yep. you would have to train them. They would have to learn your network. It took it was, it was like having a pet dog or something. You, know, you had to teach <laughs> to go to the bathroom outside. And after about a year, you appreciate the dog more, right? Well, that's how the security software was. And then it was really just watching for whenever something different happened. And it wasn't a it wasn't really a great pattern because it took a long time to to get any kind of return on investment on that hardware. What you're describing uh, is different though, right? Because you you wouldn't need a giant amount of history for that to work to notice a, a beacon. There's that behavior. Is that is that something you're you're pushing down to the unit or to the to the software with rules that you've noticed in other locations, or is this just behavior you expect to find uh, truly uniquely inside somebody's environment? So if you think about you know what is it we're interested, in? we're interested in a persistent connection between one of my internal systems and a host out on the internet. You know that's kind of my baseline. So now how do I go in and I find that? Uh, the way we do it is we go in and we break everything out into IP pairs. It's a ton of data, um, but you know databases have gotten faster. It's easier to do these days, uh, but we'll go in and we'll break out those pairs. <clears throat> now, like I said, the two most common ways that a beacon will call, or that a, a remote access Trojan will call home is it will either call up and create a connection and then just leave it open all the time or it goes off on some time schedule. So let's let's call it once per minute just for the sake of argument. So 60 times an hour, this thing's gonna call home. Well, if I have an hour's worth of data, I might have the ability to actually go in and see, oh, hey, there was 60 connections that took place. Well, times that by 24, I mean, it becomes a whole lot more obvious. So it's not so much that we're going in and we're looking for odd behaviors. You know, I mentioned looking for things like uh, user agents. We also look for things like, uh, hey, the way that host negotiates its TLS sessions, is it different versus the rest of your host? We refer to those as minor modif modifiers, meaning that if we see a beacon in place, if we see something calling home once per minute, and the user agent is unique, okay, now that's something that may pay be worth paying a little bit of extra attention to, but we've got to see that persistent communication channel in place first. You know, the other thing that gets hard is, you know, you look at things like Metaterpreter, and Metaterpreter makes it really easy for someone to say, okay, I want a beacon once per minute, and I want to vary the timing on that signal plus or minus 50%. Well, that means that I'm going to start beaconing anywhere from 30 seconds to 90 second intervals. Well, if I go in and I try and look at that statistically, it's really hard to tag that as a pattern. What we do to kind of get around that is, again, because we get so much data to work with, we'll start looking at it in one hour buckets and then we'll look at it in two hour buckets. So imagine I'm calling home once per minute, plus or minus 50%, so it's 30 seconds to 90 seconds. You're still gonna get about 60 beacon signals an hour. You're still gonna see about 120 beacon signals every two hours. So if we see 100, about 120 beacon signals every two hours and we see that over a 24 hour period of time, jitter or not, oh yeah, that's a beacon. That's something you gotta go in and you gotta pay attention to. So you know, again, why hasn't this been solved before? It's a lot of data and there's a lot of math that kind of goes into being able to tag these things. So you'll have to excuse me, security is not necessarily uh, my it. purview, but you, you kind of answered my question that I had, but for some reason, I immediately went, how do I get rid of this? Number one, is timing the biggest thing that you're looking at in these buckets? I know you have those minor modifiers, but is, is timing like your initial key metric? And if so, how do you keep it from like 
for some reason I'm thinking of like Monte Carlo or like Perlane Noise or something to where it's not plus or minus 50%, where again, that would still lead to a pattern. But, oh, I have a bunch of traffic, I cut off, I wait two hours, oh, I wait 47 minutes. Like, how does your system compensate for that? Yeah, if it goes in, it runs business hours. That that can be problematic. Uh, we, we still will we'll go in and we'll identify it over a shorter period of time. Um, we have different ways we go about the scoring on that. But one of the other things we look at is not just timing. We're also looking at session size. And session size is, is kind of a differentiator for us because when you look at the couple of threat hunting tools that are out there today, everybody's looking at timing and they're looking at like two minute intervals or less. We're looking at 24 hours and we're identifying size. Size becomes really interesting because it allows you to identify things like, was that beacon actually activated? In other words, my compromise system is calling home saying, hey, do you have anything for me to do? And a majority of the time it's being told, no, go back to sleep. Well, sometimes that attacker is going to tell it to do something. Hey, check all the running processes in memory. If you're analyzing session size, you can see that as it goes by. Um, the other thing it's good for is catching things like social media uh, being used for command and control. So a good example of that is the GCAT variant that, you know, maybe, maybe not the Russians used, yeah, right, uh, against the Ukraine to take down the power grid. I mean, that happened, I think it was about a year and a half ago, uh, where the Ukrainian power grid just went down over Christmas time. And what the maybe, maybe not Russians did was they did a spear phishing attack. They dropped uh, some spreadsheets to some end users, got them to click it, that ran a macro. And what it did is it set up a user account on their system that went in and checked a Gmail account. And that Gmail account was the command and control channel. So these things started calling out on Gmail. And now they, from a timing perspective, they don't look any different than a user checking their Gmail as well. So how do you tell the difference? Well, if you look at your average user, they're, um, if they're checking mail all day, they're going to be sending and receiving about 135 messages. From a session size perspective, all of those are going to be different. So I'm going to see this thing checking in all the time. That'll be, let's say, like a heartbeat signal. And then I'll have 135 instances of when messages were transferred, either up or down. And the sizing is going to be different for each. Because, hey, sometimes we get one word answers in our email. Sometimes it's a sentence. It's a paragraph. There might be attachments. Sizing goes all over the place. When you look at command and control being used through social media, being used through email, what you find is that beacon signal is very predominant. And sometimes they don't activate it at all, which means all you get is the heartbeat. Uh, sometimes they only activate it a couple of times. So you might see three to six instances of the size being different, and that's it. That allows you to distinguish uh, a user versus uh, a command and control channel. Now, this could be a user that we all feel sorry for because they're checking mail constantly, and no one ever sends them email, and they never receive it. But in a business environment, that's, that's rare. Because if nothing else, we're usually part of groups like the everyone group. And, you know, someone's always sending something out to the everyone group. Uh, so, again, that's that where that 135 messages per day comes from. So size analysis, that's also important to be able to uh, pull in as part of uh, catching a beacon. I think my mailbox would be the exception where I've got lots of email coming in and no email going out. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but that know, still goes towards that 135. Yes. Well, that's true. So you described a number of different criteria that you can look at, and uh, you, you actually you threw out a number with Rita earlier. You said that it, it was great for up to like 100 megabits of, of internet traffic. But beyond that, you know, you start dealing with some pretty large data sets. Uh, uh, I, I'm just trying to think of like the sheer number of packets that might move through. Uh, even, even our network here that's <clears throat> relatively small just because of the amount of video traffic we push and all that. Uh, you know, what... What size of data are, are you guys able to handle? Do you go back days, months, years, or is this all, I mean, if you're just grabbing a little bit of metadata and not the actual payload of the packet, then I could make it, I guess, it seems like you can make that a bit smaller, but it seems like it'd be a pretty huge data set. So uh, I, I want to clarify that statement. Uh, Rita will, uh, we, we've seen Rita in networks that have uh, 10 gigabit networks to the internet. So it will scale. What doesn't scale is Rita is command line based. So everything coming back comes out in comma separated format. So yeah, you're right. If you have hundreds of millions of connections taking place to try and sift through comma separated format and figure <laughs> out what's important or not, that's the part of it that doesn't really scale. Um, as far as like, you know, how much can you scale this? I mean, yeah, like I said, we've got, we've seen, uh, you know, Rita doing multiple gigabit, no problem. 
Uh, we've had customers that are, uh, some of their links are in like the 50 gigabit range. Um, you, you, you can scale this. It, it takes some work, it takes some effort. Uh, we've had customers come in, I'll, and I'll be blunt, uh, we've had customers come in where they were bigger than anyone we had ever seen before. So we crashed and burned a little bit, but we found some efficiencies, got things going, and yeah, like I said, at least up to 50 gigabit now, we seem to be in pretty good shape. And then, so I mean, and you're that's talking- hundreds of millions of connections taking place. And then that's over just a, the, the period of a day, or would that be uh, yeah, weeks, Yeah, that would months? be over, no, that would be over a period of a day. Okay. Um, well, for anybody just tuning in, we are interviewing Chris Brenton from Active uh, Countermeasures. We're talking about a couple of different things. Uh, we, we started off talking about AI, uh, AI Hunter, their uh, program for detecting uh, threat actors on your inside network. I'm trying to dodge some of our buzzwords here for buzzword bingo. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> See, you have the benefit of knowing what's on the show. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a double-edged sword, let me tell you. Um, uh, speaking, well, no, we won't dive into the double-edged sword <laughs> yeah. behind you there. But um, uh, so we are, we're learning about a couple of different things. One thing we mentioned uh, before the interview started, though, was that you know, you, you're, you're very active in the security community, uh, always working to increase awareness. And for a, for a company that's out there, let, let's just you know, try and, and go general here. For organizations that aren't doing any kind of of active uh, threat hunting. I mean, th- this would fall into the threat hunting category, right? So if if somebody's not performing that, what what should be their first step? Is, a, is an automated tool like this a, a good first step, or are there other things we should have in place before we move into a solution like this? My, my recommendation would be grab Rita. I mean, part of the reason it's free, anybody can use it, or it's open source, which means it's you know free like beer, anybody can use it, is that we want people to go in and be able to check their network. Um, so if you've never done anything, yeah, download a copy of Rita, set that up, get that going, and go in and do an analysis on your network. Uh, it, it's amazing the stuff you can find. Uh, one of our uh, earliest beta customers um, <clears throat> bought the product, got it deployed, got a hold of us about three, four days later and said, hey, we're seeing something kind of weird. Uh, can you take a look at this? We've got a couple of IP addresses that are beaconing, and you know we've run them down. And they, it's IP cameras. It's not anything running an operating system. Well, we looked at that and we're like, well, no, yeah, it is actually running an operating system. It's just an Internet of Things device. Uh, but there were three IP-based cameras they had, that their facilities team had bought off of Amazon that came uh, compromised directly from the factory that was in Quanzhou, China. And these things just you know, randomly happened to be taking snapshots of the inside of their building and sending them off to, you guessed it, Quanzhou, China. Um, So yeah, once they detected that beacon activity, once they saw it was going to Quanzhou and said, "Hmm, we don't have a business partner there or a field office, this might be suspicious, that allowed them to tag it. But what was kind of interesting about that was prior to getting our tool, they thought they were threat hunting, but they were going through logs. And Logs to me are a forensics tool. They're not a threat hunting tool. You don't threat hunt in a log. You might think you do. What you actually do is whitelist because logs were never meant for real security. You know, if you look at the syslog specification, there's no facility, there's no severity for security. So everything gets mixed in with everything else that's going on. So you spend most of your time looking at a log entry saying, is that interesting? No. Okay. Don't show me ever again. Is that interesting? No. Don't show me again. Um, <clears throat> It's kind of tough. And they were actually doing that and never caught this type of activity. That's one of the things I love about checking the wire for this type of stuff is that the network is the great equalizer. They can try to kind of mix their traffic in, but it's not like if I own your host, I might be able to hide my processes and memory. No, no, no. You can't do that on the wire. You're equal opportunity. You're there with everybody else. I just need to be good enough to be able to catch it. You know, you, you've stumbled on a bit of a uh, an inside joke that we have here at the, the podcast. Uh, those those it's webcams. an outside joke because everyone's aware of it. With, with my camera. <laughs> well, that's true. So uh, you know, we we had reported uh, a while back, over a year ago, on uh, some Foscams that you could easily buy anywhere that that had a, a known vulnerability that Foscam never bothered to patch. And uh, Peter, our co-host over here, happens to have one in his living room. So it's our uh, our running joke that you can kind of remote in. Now, when when they found that, you know, when they they found these cameras. They know what they're doing. Did they? Which approach did they take? Did they decommission the cameras and replace them, or did they just block that traffic so it wasn't able to phone back home? 
Oh no, they ripped them out of the network. They ripped them out of the network. They reached out to the manufacturer. The manufacturer claimed, yeah, we don't know anything about that. Um, you know, it must have gotten compromised on your network and just, you know, happens to be beaconing back to where we're actually located. We had nothing to do with that. Yeah, definitely the innocent actor there. Well, look, if you yes. want to get a camera for, you know, less than $49, <laughs> you've got to be willing to uh, to make some compromises, Dom. Yeah, it, exactly. It's exactly. the Facebook pricing model, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. some comp- I don't know if well, I you know, qualify that as some, though. <laughs> that seems like uh, all, all, yeah. compromises. all the compromises. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, and, 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 you know, quite honestly, that problem is becoming far more persistent. Uh, you may remember a little less than two years ago, uh, the Internet went away on the East Coast and through parts of Europe. Um, there was a company that a lot of people had not heard of named Dyn um, that was running a good portion of DNS for the Internet. And a lot of folks hadn't realized that. And they got hit with a distributed denial of service attack. Um, I was actually involved with. Uh, a lot of the recovery on that and doing a lot of the decodes to see, hey, what was hitting them? Um, I I will say to their credit, um, the order of magnitude of the attack was probably about 50 times bigger than anything they had dealt with before. So, you know, why did they roll over and play dead? Well, because they said, well, we've seen an attack that was at a two, so we'll make sure we can handle a four and, you know, this was a 50. But going through and uh, decoding the traffic that was seen. One, I, I know I'm going to be sound weird here, but one of the things I love doing is passive fingerprinting. So I love going through packets to figure out, hey, what operating system sent this? Um, a huge portion of the attacks <laughs> came from um, internet controllable thermostats. So these Internet of Things devices that people have in their house that allows them to, oh, hey, I forgot to turn the temperature down. Let me just remote in and get that. Yeah, you know, you, you're talking about there's a trade-off to this stuff. Well, that's one of the trade-offs. The bad guys can get in, too, and say, hey, participate in this DDoS attack for me. Well, yeah, no problem. Yeah, you know, I remember when the, the Dyn incident happened, and I thought it was funny because then they, they went on to get acquired by Oracle. And yes. uh, so, you know, it just goes to show you that even if you have a major security related infrastructure incident, your company still has a great valuation. <laughs> <laughs> a slight discount. but yeah. yeah. Well, a slight discount or maybe they looked at that and said, oh, we didn't know they were there. Oh, OK. So, you know, maybe that actually got them. Some, no got press them is bad press. Bought. That's right. what they say. Yeah. 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 And, it, and how many thermostats got sold as a result of that, too? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, that that problem is getting bigger and bigger. And I've seen different companies trying to solve it different ways. Uh, I know Cloudflare has been out there talking pretty heavily about how they have a bigger data pipe than any other company on the planet. So that uh, if you can't dodge the DOS or the DDoS, you just take it like a champ and you've got the bandwidth to handle it and stay online. I, I, that's not their official marketing no, statement. Take, no, it, take no. it like a champ. That's a- but it should be. It should be. If you're getting hit in the face a lot, well, let us put a little more padding on yeah. your face. Yeah, it's not gonna- <laughs> so, uh, that's, uh, so- uh, although I do seem to remember reading about um, a couple of customers getting hit really hard in the face that they ended up asking to leave and they ended up on Google. Uh, Google actually has this if you're really downtrodden, you know, or you've got nation states coming after you, we've got a special environment. We'll run you in and we'll, we'll you know, we've got your back on this, which I thought was kind of cool. Well, you learn something new every day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> actually, it almost made me forget what I was going to ask you. So some of these Internet connected devices, we recently got a new air conditioning. Our thermostat has the ability to connect. And uh, my significant other is, hey we should connect this to the internet. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't trust any of this. I mean, I've been watching Peter work on his the whole time. I'm, what? I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> um, however, this is one of those things that we joke early on that I'm from a developer background, not really worried about security. So I'm kind of interested of why you went the uh, command line interface uh, approach to like looking around, like why didn't you just make this like click, 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 or was it for performance reasons? This is totally off topic. I'm just interested from a development standpoint. Well, Rita is command line based. Yep. And a lot of the reason for that was um, it was just the easiest way to go through and do the development. You know, no user interface to worry about beyond the command line. Uh, AA Hunter is actually, you know, does give you a web-based graphical interface to go through and use. So the commercial tool, yes, does have a pretty GUI. The open source tool does not. 
follow-up question to that. So you said that Rita is like returning, uh, I think you said CSVs or TSVs? CSVs. CSVs. Yeah, it's comma separated output. Uh, can I, like, does Rita provide a facility for me to like put that in Logstash or ingest that in other manners? Or can I just like keep that? Or, or how does that work? Because I'm trying to think of like scale or additional analytics that I might want to run. Like, is that just something that I can do? Or do you recommend against that? Yeah, so, so you could run all the output through Logger. Um, that would, you know, obviously get it off to whatever syslog compatible device that you have. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. We provide a lot of detail, especially if we see something that we think is uh, command and control taking place over DNS. Uh, that would light your logger up like a Christmas tree. Um, you could go through and do some parsing and have some of that kick off in the logger, uh, or excuse me, kick off to syslog. But there's no logging facility built in Arita. There is in the commercial product, though. Uh, in the commercial product, you, and again, we're trying to focus more on security operation centers. So there's a uh, syslog facility where you can send alerts. Uh, you can also dump things down to a Slack channel. You know, I, I'm curious, you know, based on your experience out there in the field and working with customers, um, is there any real value to the older data, or is the last 24 hours enough to, to really know what's going on? Yeah, uh, so when, when, we, the, when you first get the tool online, I recommend folks go through about three days worth of data. And the reason for that is just to make sure that if you happen to miss something the first time, you catch it the second time. I've done that um, because it can be a lot of data to go through. Uh, once you have that up and running, yeah, you're right. The last 24 hours really is the only thing that's really interesting to you. Um, if an incident occurs, the previous 24 hours might be interesting as well. Uh, but you know, probably not. We give customers the ability to go in and say, yeah, anything older than a week, nuke it, or anything older than 30 days, nuke it. Um, and, you know, and a lot of folks take advantage of that. But, yeah, you know, I might have, you know, some retention policies I need to worry about. Uh, beyond that, I don't think it's really worth keeping it long. All right. Now, I know no system is foolproof that there's, there's certainly alternative ways people can exfiltrate data. So if they're exfiltrating it over the network, hopefully you see that or you see the beacons to allow the connections. But there, there are other methods people could be getting data out. So for a, for a well-rounded kind of security solution, if somebody wants to make sure they're doing all they can to just detect that activity, what, what are some of the other things you'd recommend they, they implement in addition to this? Oh, two-word answer to that one, carbon black. Uh, uh, Carbon Black is an awesome tool. I've been involved with that crew since uh, their old bit nine days. I mean, it is just an awesome tool for locking things down. Is it perfect? No, nothing's ever perfect. But the amount of visibility they give you into, uh, you know, what processes are running, what are they opening up sockets to, when, you know, is this software unique within your network? Is it just on that one system or do you have it on a bunch of different systems? Where was it introduced to your network? Who passed it around if anybody did? And the amount of visibility there is awesome. The only caveat with Carbon Black is it's agent-based. So, you know, if you run a Windows, Mac, you're in great shape. But your network hardware, your Internet of Things devices, your Linux systems, if you you know still have an Amiga plugged into the network, it isn't going to be able to help you out with that stuff. Uh, but yeah, Carbon Black, that's that's where I push people. All right. And uh, I don't think we've – have we interviewed Carbon Black? I, I, think I was just looking because I, I, I know that we've talked about them a lot, but I don't think that we've ever actually had them on here. So it's we? funny that you – because I just, I just – I was like, wait a minute. That sounds familiar. I went to the website. I remember looking at that website, so I don't know if we've talked to somebody or we talked to somebody who was like yeah, also had that recommendation. It, yeah. yeah, wow, we're hey, if you want professionals here. If you want a tech <laughs> contact, let me know offline off of here. I'll connect you with somebody. Not a problem. They're, yeah. they're an awesome team. All right, sounds good. Well, so I'm curious if uh, if someone wants to learn more uh, about your system uh, in particular, what's the best way to to reach out to you and find out? Uh, go to activecountermeasures.com. Uh, we've got a blog. Uh, a lot of that, that, yeah, there's some, hey, we got a new release that we just came out with. So there's a little bit of marketing up there. Hey, and there has to be. We're a company. Uh, but we try to do an awful lot of uh, industry education. We try to do an awful lot of, um, you know, and actually I, I kind of brought this up ahead of time. Um, I did a blog entry that has gotten me um, some kudos and a lot of shade, which was I went through and compared PCI to the South Park underwear gnomes. 
and kind of talk <laughs> about why is PCI going to continue to fail us? Well, they're following the South Park Underwear Gnomes business model, and this is why, and this is what we need to change. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff out like that up there. We do webcasts, and you know, we're just constantly trying to push out education. Uh, my co-founder, John Strand, uh, he's just coming out of being a SANS instructor as well. We're both big on education. So yeah, as much as we can do to help out the community, we do. So activecountermeasures.com, yeah, go up there and uh, learn about threat hunting. Yeah, it's always step two of, of those uh, underwear gnomes. It's the difficult one. Um, exactly. Yeah, right? But uh, you've also got a couple of uh, speaking events coming up or conferences you guys going to be at? Yeah, uh, we're going to be at, uh, we're gonna be at uh, Cisco, Cisco Live. Uh, we're actually going to, we, we don't have our own booth there. We're going to be there with Gigamon as part of an announcement that I will let Gigamon take care of their own announcements. Uh, but it, I have to say, from a network Bitweeny perspective, oh my God, they're into some cool stuff. Um, so they're a recent partner of ours. We're going to be there with them. Uh, we're also going to be at the Gartner event two weeks from now uh, out in uh, Washington, D.C. Sounds good. Well, we almost broke some some news there. That's that's disappointing. We couldn't make that announcement here on Technado. But <laughs> next time, I know you got to work that out with PR and all that good stuff. But hey, uh, thank you so I, much. I, I will oh. say, if you're into security on the network, watch the Gigamon announcements over the next month or two. They, they're coming out with some really good stuff. Yeah, Cisco Live, I think, yeah, later in uh, July. or uh, Cisco Live is actually next week. Oh, Cisco. Okay, yeah, that's next week. Great. So, yeah, we'll keep an eye on that and and uh, and see what's coming out of that. But Chris, thank you uh, so much for taking the time with us today, and hopefully we can reach out again in the future if uh, if anything comes up that uh, we can get your insight on. Sound good? Awesome. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Yep. Appreciate your time. Yep, definitely. Well, thank you, and thank you all of you who are watching. But stay tuned. We've got more Technado coming up right after this. I'm James Packer. I'm the General Manager of Kirk ISS based in the Cayman Islands. I used IT Pro TV extensively in my last place. It grew very well, helped upskill the team. I had 110 engineers in the field and we had dozens of IT Pro accounts with the guys training and last year alone they passed over 40 certs by using the online training. I think I can safely say um, without IT Pro TV I wouldn't be where I was today because I only got this job on the back of the qualifications I have. All right, thank you, Chris, for joining us today. And that, that was a really uh, in insightful interview, and I was uh, really happy to hear about some of that stuff that I actually followed and understood. And I'm even happier to say that uh, both uh, both of us got bingo. Uh, and it's funny because we looked over at Tom's, we're like, how do you not get that? Because I, we're all, we all had the same uh, word in that line, and you don't have it, but it's because you're the one that said it. I need the word hacking. I just assumed that... Chris would say it repeatedly. He didn't say the word hacking. Is I, I got to play the interview back because I don't believe he said it a single no, time. I don't think so. So what makes this worse is I'm the one who said hacking, and I gave and you literally two ding dongs. We both got bingo because of and, that. And it's <sighs> funny because like I got it because of ROI. Yeah, which I was like, I oh too. man, I'm never gonna get ROI. Said it, and you, you've got uh, you've so got ROI on your card, but you said but it, but you can it, have so it now. Mark it. It's still no, oh, I just said it now because I said. Yeah, he said it too, but it still doesn't help you because yeah. you're still missing the old H word, which he said. He said uh, you get whacked. He yeah. said, oh, when they got whacked uh, on their system, How they got whacked. How do you say that system, without like, the W? Man, <laughs> yeah. Or is he saying it like like Stewie? He's like <laughs> whacked. <laughs> yeah. Why are you putting a weird <laughs> emphasis that, on that? Uh, but no, that, that that was a cool interview, and I, and I hope we can get Chris on again because he he puts things in terms that that I think uh, you know the lay person like myself and and when it comes to security, Mr. Dennison, here, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we uh, can understand. I, I was just happy that I was like, yeah, I know what you're. Oh, see yeah. what you're saying. Ah, oh, yeah, we are getting. Don didn't talk the whole time, so I was happy. Mm -hmm. Right, we. I asked a couple of questions. It was fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah you you actually earned your paycheck today. I did. I did. <laughs> uh, as did you. I, yeah. Well, I'm about to because this is the part where I do stuff. Uh, all right. So I got to let you know about a couple things coming up uh, over here at IT Pro TV. First of all, we've got Live Week coming up. That's June 17th through the 21st. Uh, we're we're live every day here at IT Pro TV, but uh, this week we're doing some very special stuff. Justin's going to be a game show host. We're going to have. Um, different days that focus on different topics like a CompTIA day, getting started in IT day, overcoming challenges, things like that. So uh, definitely head over to go.itpro.tv slash live dash week. And uh, if you're not a member of IT Pro TV, 
doesn't cost a thing to be able to watch the, the live stream. You can join for free and you can uh, participate in that week and we'll have a lot of fun there. Um, also want to let you know about some webinars coming up. We just did one today, PowerShell to the People. Uh, and we've got uh, a new one that uh, we don't actually have on our website yet, but it's about um, we've got a disaster recovery one, uh, right, that you're doing, Don, with Daniel. Uh, I think Daniel? I'm doing it with Mike. We got a, a little series going on there. Yep. Now, is that are we talking about like natural disasters or like uh, like like hurricane preparedness and stuff like that, or just in general backing up and? Uh, it, it would be a what we consider a, a total disaster. So okay. it could be a hurricane, could be a terrorist attack, could total be clips of the heart. Could be a power outage, sure. right? You know, I mean, just something as simple as that. So we're going to do one webinar on long-term planning, like the things that you should be putting in place if you haven't already. Uh, and then we're going to do another webinar on short-term. Last minute, you've, you you either have neglected your duties or you, you've done everything, but you just want to make sure what are some last-minute things that you can check on uh, and kind of get yourself protected. Well, the key to, to that, too, is taping up all the little cheese grater holes on your new, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your new... Tower yeah, you don't want your cheese going bad. Well, I just meant to keep the water out instead of all those holes. I bet it floats. Well, if it juices, then it's got to have some kind of <laughs> yeah, protection. That's true. Right? It's a, you just it feed IP, it full of carrots, IP and it'll be fine. IP it was IP97 or something yeah, like that. IP uh, Freely, the, you know, whatever <laughs> freely, that is. That's the one. <laughs> that's the one. Uh, nailed it. All right. We're call it calling Moe's. <laughs> All right. Uh, last but not least, uh, head over to uh, go.itpro.tp slash technado. We've got a special offer code for 30% off your subscription to IT Pro TV. Um, you can enjoy Live Week uh, as well if you do that. Also have uh, some information for businesses if you want to get a team trial and find out all the cool features available to you if uh, if you have a team. Uh, so that's go.itpro.tv slash technado. Well, this was fun. Two of us uh, got bingo today because of the word hacking, and uh, Don didn't even notice the fact that I just said it and could have could have checked it off. Well, what does it matter at this point? It's a, <laughs> oh man, he's deflated. Another, there. another pity bingo. Oh, right. Another pity this bingo. Is, well, I'll be able to play yeah. in the bingo minor league. Put it, <laughs> put it on the fridge at home, and you're and you almost if you had gotten uh, I mean it's, it's over at this point, but if you had gotten threat assessment, you you would have. Had Double bingo so, with hacking. Does that count for something? How did threat assessment not get said in that interview, too? And, you know, if we were interviewing, like, from the perspective the of Black person? Hills, oh. that oh, would have come yeah. up. But uh, from active countermeasures, I guess not. Not going to happen. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for watching this week. And make sure you tune in next week. We'll be uh, right back here with you with some more great interviews and news. And I don't know if maybe Microsoft come out with a $1,000 monitor stand to compete. Uh, and we'll be able to talk about that. But... We'll see you next time right here on TechNATO.